Delighted to introduce this session with John Moore, who's senior staff photographer with Getty, who's covered wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, just come back from Zimbabwe, um, won numerous top photography awards. And he's one of the few people, few photographers, who actually lives in the place that he covers. He lives in Pakistan. And it's because of that that he was in Pakistan when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated last December and took an amazing set of photo photographs which ended up on front pages all over the world, I think. Um, and for that, he won the Robert Kappa Gold Medal, which was highly deserved. And John is going to be taking us through his photographs of the last year in Pakistan tonight. Um, which was a, a momentous year in Pakistan's history. And I just give a short overview of, of what happened in that year. I was just thinking on the way here that actually it's almost a year ago that I was sitting with Benazir not far from here talking about her planned return to Pakistan. And she was very excited and transformed really from when I'd seen her before when she'd really been depressed about being in exile, had been putting on weight, had been really feeling that her political future was over. And suddenly here was the old Benazir full of fire and really excited about going back, um, slightly glossing over the fact that she was doing a deal with um, the devil, doing a deal with Musharraf, somebody that she'd always fought against. Um, of course, this was something that was very controversial both um, within her own circles as well as outside. Anyway, um, her trip back was delayed various times. Eventually, she ended up going back in October and set off with a large number of journalists in tow. Some of the people who went might be here tonight. If you were, you'll remember that it was um, a rather tumultuous <laughs> plane journey, um, very lively to say the least from here to Dubai some of the people that were on the plane ended up being actually removed <laughs> at Dubai and then the next bit from Dubai to Karachi I think was even more hysteria about the idea of going back and Benazir actually had to go into the cockpit and give orders to her um, supporters to calm down, otherwise the pilot wouldn't land the plane. So I don't think Emirates Airlines would, will ever fly a returning Pakistan opposition leader <laughs> back. So anyway, as you know, when she got back, um, there was the long procession and lots of excitement, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but sadly, that triumphant return ended in tragedy with the bombs about nine hours after the cavalcade had set off. And I was actually with her on the bus when it was bombed. And no, personally, just how lucky she was and how lucky I was as well to survive that. And that just showed me what a courageous person she was because then at her house later that night talking to her and we were watching the BBC seeing the figures of the number of dead which I think started off saying 15 dead and we were saying well we saw lots more people than that it's got to be more and then suddenly it was going up 50 80 over 100 and I think up until that moment she although she talked a lot about assassination threats had not really appreciated just how much danger she was in. And I saw her go upstairs, and she hadn't been in that house for uh, about eight or nine years, all the time she was in exile. And I saw her go upstairs and then come back down and touch the photographs of her children on the wall. Um, and clearly she was thinking, you know, what have I taken on? But there was kind of no going back for her there and we talked about that the next day and the, the risk that she was in and she said you know I'm, I've come back and I'm going to go on with this and I said to her well I hope you don't mind if I don't come on any more vehicles with you <laughs> um, which she laughed at anyway as you know 10 weeks after that um, she was killed and um, John I think we'll talk more about that later but um, I went back to Pakistan after that and was so depressed about the future of Pakistan, I thought, 
you know, Benazir, the, the best hope, whatever thoughts that she had, the best hope for Pakistan's future had gone. And it was really sad going to see, going to her family home, going to the mausoleum that she'd built for her father that wasn't even finished still, and then seeing her body lying there, her father's, her two brothers, and you just thought, you know, what uh, cost this family has paid. Um, I went back again for the elections in February, which uh, everybody was saying were going to be very violent and maybe rigged, and there was lots of predictions of doom and gloom. And in fact, the elections were pretty much free and fair, which meant that most of the journalists left. Um, mm. But what happened was the opposition um, did very well. And most of the people I spoke to were voting for the opposition either for sympathy for Benazir or because they hated Musharraf. So you ended up with um, uh, Benazir's party getting the most seats in parliament, but also Nawaz Sharif's Muslim League, a great rival to Benazir in the past, um, also doing surprisingly well. And so the two parties together have formed an alliance, which I found, having gone back and forth for years and knowing how much they'd always hated each other, was very surprising to see, but positive, I think, for <coughs> Pakistan that they could, in that time, decide to work together. Um, Nawaz Sharif's price to join the, the alliance was that Musharraf should go and that the judges who had been removed by Musharraf in, when he declared state of emergency last November should be restored and gave a deadline for that. That was not met, um, which led to him pulling his ministers out of the cabinet last month. And Pakistan is now once more in its usual state of uncertainty. I have to say one of the things I found really shocking the week after the elections was having heard so many times British and American um, government representatives talk about how important it was to have free and fair elections, to then see the British and American ambassadors go and talk to Azif Sadari and Nawaz Sharif and say to them how important it was to keep Musharraf in power, despite the fact that it seems to me that what that vote was, perhaps more than anything in the election, was a vote against Musharraf. So we have this very strange, unholy alliance now of these two parties that really hate each other, Musharraf, who they, neither of them like, all somehow working together. Um, but the, you know, it, the positive thing that is that since the elections, Pakistan, which was having almost daily suicide bombs, blasts, um, before the elections has been very quiet, almost no attacks. And today, as you may know, there was a bomb at the Danish embassy where the last I heard eight people had been killed. I don't know what the latest figure. So um, I hope that doesn't mean that this is a start of things to come. But um, I'm very happy to introduce John tonight to talk to us about his experiences being in Pakistan. And maybe, John, you could just start by explaining to us what made you decide to go there before you give your presentation. Sure. Well, well th thank you, Christina, for going over the, giving an overview of what's been happening there lately, because it's, uh, it's, for those of you who've watched this over the last year, it's quite complicated, the, uh, the different uh, occurrence of events that have happened uh, in Pakistan, really in the last year. Uh, before, before March of last year, it was a, uh, it was a, a relatively sleepy capital city. Um, I moved there in, uh, in the uh, summer of 2005. Um, my wife, uh, Gretchen Peters, uh, was offered a position uh, as the, uh, the chief producer and correspondent for ABC television uh, based in uh, Islamabad. And um, in my last previous two postings, uh, both of them for the Associated Press, um, she had moved uh, for me. And so it was really, uh, it was really her turn. And so, um, and so I moved from AP and, uh, and went to Getty Images. Uh, Getty was happy uh, for me to be based uh, anywhere in that region. Uh, um, uh, I told them I'd, I'd like to be based. Uh, they said, well, wh what about uh, Istanbul? I said, well, that's that sounds like a nice city, uh, but I think we'll be going to Islamabad. And they looked at me and they said, well, knock yourself out. Uh, you're, <laughs> but, but, but go for it. Uh, and, 
And so we moved uh, to Islamabad, uh, her in charge of Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan for her, her uh, media outlet and, and, and me working for Getty, uh, covering that region. And, um, and it was a quiet city. Uh, it was, uh, the rest of Pakistan, of course, had problems, uh, and it has for a long time. Um, but I used Islamabad as a base. Um, I was traveling to Afghanistan a lot. Um, things, uh, things began picking up in Afghanistan, as we all know, in the last couple of years with the insurgency there, um, especially in the east and south. Um, I was traveling to Kabul. In fact, when we, um, when we went to um, Pakistan in the summer of 2005, uh, we went uh, three times to Kabul uh, with our, um, with our, uh, our several-month-old uh, little girl. Um, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, Kabul as a place uh, which is uh, chaotic yet peaceful. Um, that's exactly what it was uh, throughout 2005. It wasn't until 2006 uh, that Afghanistan and specifically the capital city started getting bad. So I was able to travel um, in the region uh, with my family. Um, uh, that of course changed. Uh, I've been going to Iraq uh, quite a bit since the, uh, the invasion in, in 2003 and I continued doing that and used Islamabad as a base. Um, and really, it wasn't until uh, Musharraf sacked uh, the Supreme Court Justice uh, this last March that things uh, really took off. Um, uh, President Musharraf really had um, no anticipation that, um, uh, that, that, that things would turn out the way they did. Um, um, he, he had always said that he was very popular. Just talk to people in the countryside, they'll tell you they support me. And in fact, a lot of people did. Um, uh, it was, uh, there was a certain amount of stability uh, and um, while he didn't have overwhelming support as he claimed, he did have a fair amount of support. And it was, uh, it was a relatively quiet story. And so I used Pakistan as a base um, and was uh, for the, my first two years there and was traveling uh, in and out and, um, and, and things uh, began to take off in the spring of last year. So what we, what we can do here is, um, um, you came to see pictures and I'm gonna show you some photographs here um, from this last year. Uh, I think there's a total of 45. Uh, most of them are uh, an overview of um, of what happened this last year. In the last section, uh, we'll look at uh, the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, which of, of course was, uh, was the, uh, the horrible climax to a, a, a tough year in that country. So if we can dim the lights, we'll, I'll, and Christina, if you have uh, any questions uh, during this, afterwards uh, we'll have time for a bit of uh, discussion, uh, question answer, or just, or just discussion amongst uh, all of us here and uh, talk about, uh, about this country and where it's going, what's, what's, what's what's happened in this last year. Um, these fellas here um, didn't look very happy for me to be there. Um, this was outside of the Lal Masjid, the Red Mosque in Pakistan, the capital, Islamabad. Um, only a very short distance from the presidency and the U.S. Embassy. Um, these fellows uh, were, um, were, were protesting. Um, you can see the, 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 the smoke in the background. Uh, that's coming from, from this particular fire. They, um, they raided a number of um, DVD and CD shops um, throughout that part of uh, Islamabad, um, claiming that, uh, that the, um, the Western material on them was un-Islamic. And um, this, I, I, don't, I wish I had the picture to show you, but I did, I did take a close-up of one of these burning DVDs in the pile of, uh, of the Lion King. Uh, that was an <laughs> unacceptable uh, piece of entertainment there. Um, this went on um, throughout the spring. Um, I was there in the spring. Um, I left, actually, um, with all that I, I covered in Pakistan this last year, I wasn't there in the summer. Um, we went back to the States uh, for the birth of our, our second little girl, and, uh, and, uh, and I wasn't there when, they, when, the, when the army raided the mosque. Um, ultimately, they had a, a bloodbath there, and these people were driven out. How were they able to do this right in the center of the capital? That's what everyone wondered. You know, most uh, most moderate, uh, most Pakistanis are very moderate folks, uh, and uh, and. Uh, and a lot of people, especially in the capital, uh, wondered how they they would be allowed to get away with that for so long. Um, certainly, certainly there were elements in the government um, uh, who were sympathetic uh, to the uh, and are still sympathetic uh, to the uh, radical Islamic cause. Um, I think Musharraf uh, found himself uh, stuck in a hard place. He didn't know which way to go. I uh, I, I spoke with um, with Ryan Crocker, who's the American amb ambassador in Iraq now. He was in Pakistan at the time, um, and I asked him, you know, I said, you know, what, what what was up with that? And uh, he said, well, he said. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. He said, uh, I, I, "He said I sat down with uh, President Musharraf. We 
I asked him the same question, uh, and, he, and, um, and uh, the, the Americans were pushing hard for um, the, the, uh, the, the, the army, uh, Musharraf uh, specifically, to crack down on this, um, on this, madras, on this madrasa very early on, um, and, uh, and they let it uh, simmer and fester, uh, and, the, and these, uh, these students grew, grew bolder and bolder, um, the women students uh, as well, uh, grew bolder and bolder and were ki began kidnapping uh, people they accused of being prostitutes. Uh, uh, Seizing DVDs, uh, uh, and and by the time the Pakistani army went in, these these uh, these um, these Islamic students had become very bold, and were uh, and it, were used to getting their way. And um, uh, in in addition, you know, I asked uh, during that same conversation, I, I asked uh, Crocker about uh, about Musharraf's sacking of the uh, of the Supreme Court justice. Uh, 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 Iftikhar Chaudhry, um, and he said, "Yeah, I asked him about that too." And um, and Musharraf said um, that he said, "I never expected that he wouldn't step down, and we didn't have a plan B." And that's how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> this frame here is um, is from the Swat Valley of uh, northwestern Pakistan. Um, it's uh, used to be a, a big tourist site, especially for uh, Pakistani tourists, but uh, also uh, foreigners as well. It used to be very safe, very beautiful area. Um, this fellow uh, is a uh, what they call a local Taliban. Um, he was throwing some money onto the pile. As you can see, there's uh, there's earrings and gold rings there on the table from local residents. Uh, it's not unfair to say that the uh, the local Taliban had a fair amount of public public support um, in that area, and they collected this uh, this money from the public um, uh, to support their cause. And uh, and the the, the the Taliban came to control pretty much all of the Swat Valley except for the, um, well, even really including the, uh, the district capital of, uh, of um, Mingora. And, uh, and, uh, and this was the case until later in the year when the army came in and swept, uh, swept them out. Um, I was able to get in to this area. It's very rare these days for journalists, uh, certainly Western journalists, to get in uh, with, uh, and photograph uh, Taliban. Um, I had had an interview set up. I do a bit of multimedia as well, uh, video and audio. Um, for our, our website, and, uh, and uh, I had an interview set up with the Taliban spokesman, and um, and so uh, as in any uh, with the, in the Pashtun uh, culture there, if you if you come in as a guest, um, you're going to be fairly safe. Um, the, the the guest culture is the reason why um, many think that uh, Osama bin Laden is still at, still at large, and if in fact he's alive, uh, uh, because uh, because they won't give up their guests, and if you're a guest, you can get in. And I, w I went in as a guest, and the next day I wanted to go in and shoot more because. It's, it's tough to shoot these, photograph these guys. And, uh, and I was told, no, the Uzbeks, uh, a group of Uzbek um, Al-Qaeda um, uh, fighters had come in, and the Uzbeks don't follow their uh, chain of command. They just, uh, they do what they want. So it was too dangerous. But I did get one day. <clears throat> I'll show you a close-up here in a second. This Buddha uh, overlooks uh, the Swat Valley uh, and has, um, since Buddhism was uh, was prominent there um, a long time ago, and um, uh, this was considered the uh, the second most important uh, Buddhist um, archaeological site in the region, following the Bamiyan um, the Bamiyan Buddhas of uh, of the Bamiyan province of Afghanistan. As we all know, they were destroyed by the Taliban um, some years ago. And this, in the case of this Buddha. Um, Apparently they, they went back, the locals said they went back uh, several different times. At first they went back uh, and placed a bomb at the bottom of it, um, um, exploded it, didn't do any damage. Um, this is a boulder on the side of a mountain. Um, then they put, the, uh, they put an explosive charge on top of the boulder, and as you can see it sheared off the top part, but it didn't damage the Buddha itself. Um, and so uh, what they did next uh, on another occasion, they, they came back with hundreds of armed fighters, uh, secured the area uh, in, in darkness, um, raised a ladder, um, put it up again against the Buddha's chest, um, brought up a, a, a gasoline um, a generator and an extension cord and a power drill, and they drilled off his face. And that's the way he'll be forevermore. <clears throat> this one here, um, curious sight. This, uh, this, is a, this is a mural outside of a cinema um, in, the, in the district capital there, in the, in the Swat Valley. Um, uh, some, as, you know, as many of you know, uh, uh, the, uh, under, uh, under certain, uh, certain radical vers versions of uh, interpretation, uh, interpretations of Islam, uh, uh, painting a person's face is, uh, is considered uh, blasphemy. Uh, somehow the rest of her body was fine, but uh, <laughs> uh, her face was unacceptable, so they got rid of that. <clears throat> 
These are tribal elders. Um, this was shot in um, North Waziristan. Uh, it's very rare for, um, for us to be able to get in, get in as foreign journalists into either North or South Waziristan. It's a part of what's called the FATA, the feder federally administer administered tribal areas uh, near the Afghan border. Um, it's a very dangerous place for us to, to go on our own, but uh, occasionally, about once a year, the Army will take journalists in um, on a junket uh, on, on these old helicopters, and uh, we'll go in and uh, they'll have something set up for us. And there's a number of pictures I'll show you here from, from North Waziristan. They had struck a deal uh, in, um, with, with the Taliban, local Taliban there, uh, between the Army um, and the militants. Uh, uh, the deal, of course, as many, as many of you know, uh, was, so, was that uh, the militants would no longer attack the Pakistani Army troops and that they wouldn't do uh, stage cross border attacks against uh, uh, against coalition forces uh, American forces uh, etc on the uh, on the on the Afghan side of course uh, US commanders on the Afghan uh, side said that the the tax went up several hundred percent um, after this deal was made so um, um, ultimately uh, ultimately this deal uh, with these folks uh, fell through and the army got uh, involved once again in, in large-scale fighting with them. Now, now the new government uh, currently is uh, is brokering a, a similar type deal, and we'll see where that goes. And this is the this is the area there. It's vast and rugged and uh, and very difficult difficult uh, for any army. Um, you know, the, you ask them any American, uh, British, or Canadian commander on the other side of the border, which looks exactly like this on the Afghan side, and they'll tell you it's tough. Um, uh, the, the Taliban fighters, the Al Qaeda fighters, are a very very rugged lot. They um, they can uh, they can walk around these mountains in sandals and uh, and with a blanket and uh, and uh, their gun and and they don't need a whole lot more if they can find water here and there, uh, a couple goats. They, they, they're, they're very tough, um, and, it's, uh, and, and they can live in these conditions uh, with few supplies, um, whereas, the, um, whereas the army, the Pakistani army, um, the U.S. Army on the other side of the border, Canadians, et cetera, British, um, they have to deal with the uh, supplies and, and, and uh, supp supply lines and uh, transport. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a wild and, and tough place to work, and this, and this is in Muranshah, Muramshah, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, the uh, Pakistani forces were there at a base. Uh, this is <laughs> our helicopter. I was, it was. It looks like I'm out there on my own. It, it, behind me, there's about 40 other journalists uh, um, <laughs> piling onto a piling onto a helicopter, and uh, the pilot was yelling at me to get in, uh, and I uh, had to get one more shot off. That was this one. Once again, this is in the western Pakistan. This is, um, this is in the Swat uh, Valley uh, from some of the photos I showed you before. Um, the army came in and swept uh, these militants out of the region. Um, um, not that many were killed. Most of them got away. Um, as you can see, if you look closely, I'm not the only journalist there. There's a cameraman poised there towards the center of the frame uh, photographing a, a soldier on a snow-capped hill there. This is some of the armaments uh, that uh, were confiscated from from uh, these fighters. Uh, you know the grenades and the uh, the RPG rounds and these little ball bearings there, um, along with the plastic uh, sheet of plastic explosive uh, with this in the soldier's hand, are, are used for suicide vests, uh, which have become quite a uh, popular um, weapon in the last year. Again, in SWAT, um, this. This is a paramilitary soldier, um, um, Pakistani soldier, um, who, who, was, um, who got, got into a firefight with um, Taliban uh, militants. Uh, this is in no man's land. Uh, uh, they, this is when the army and the, and the paramilitary came in to try and sweep out the Taliban from the, this area. Um, I think this fellow was killed uh, maybe three days before. I, had a, I was working with a local journalist um, in Mingora there in the, the district capital of this, uh, of this valley um, who was very good, uh, worked for uh, Aj TV, very, very well connected, and he's from SWAT. And so we really knew um, how uh, he's the one who got me the interview uh, with the, uh, the Taliban spokesman, um, um, taking me straight into a, an area which, uh, which normally one wouldn't go into. Um, Working with local journalists really, um, really makes a lot of this possible, and uh, and I and I want to you know give credit to a lot of the people that I work with in the region, um, whether it's uh, whether it's in Pakistan or Afghanistan or or Zimbabwe or various places I've worked in the last year. Um, um, these local journalists uh, 
they have to stay and continue working when I'm gone. And uh, they keep me out of trouble and, and, and manage to help me uh, make pictures along the way. Um, this, um, this area here was about a, a kilometer stretch of, uh, of no man's land between the government uh, forces and the, and the militants. Um, uh, we talked to some people on the road, and they said the militants uh, were not around in that area at the time. So we went, we went in, um, photographed here. The, there were many other pictures, uh, more gruesome ones. Uh, this uh, this this soldier was 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 beheaded, um, and uh, and as were so, so several of his colleagues that were behind me. Um, now, why are people running away? The um, the Pakistani army had come in with a helicopter, and they were hovering above us, and they were afraid we were going to get shot. So um, soon after this. Very soon after this picture uh, was taken, I was like this fellow running away myself. Pakistanis have been victims of uh, terrorism. Um, a lot of civilians have, have lost, lost their lives, the military as well. These, uh, these people are watching the television or the news when, um, when a, um, a train earlier this last year, you know, Pakistan and India now have trains and buses going back and forth so family members can visit each other on either side of the border. Families split up long ago in the, in the partition. And, um, and a, a, a train load of, um, of Pakistani um, um, family members was coming back towards Pakistan when, the, when, the, uh, when their train was uh, attacked and uh, the bomb and uh, killed many, many people, um, dozens, I can't remember, maybe 60, I can't remember. Um, and, uh, and this happened in India and it was suspected uh, by a, done by a, a Hindu fundamentalist group, uh, of course, it was never proved, but um, uh, there's a lot of suffering on many sides there. This isn't far from my house in uh, Islamabad. The, um, the Jinnah market, um, a lot of disparity um, uh, between uh, rich and poor. Um, this fellow, uh, this fellow, I think, had polio, um, and he worked uh, worked that market. In fact, I saw him walking along like this uh, a good um, a good seven or eight kilometers from there uh, the next day. Uh, um, he and he was walking down the street just like this, um, and uh, very common. The markets. Polio is still a, a big problem in that part of the world, especially Afghanistan. It's been eradicated uh, in places that we live. Uh, I was down in Karachi um, photographing ahead of, um, of Benazir's arrival um, in October, and I was shooting some features. This is the children working at a landfill. General Musharraf and General Kiani. Um, this as many of you know um, from the stories of this last year, um, Musharraf uh, ultimately, under international pressure, um, had to give up control um, of the army, um, if not control, at least the official leadership of the army. Um, and this was at the, his, uh, the farewell ceremony for him, um, uh, the change of command ceremony, when he, when he handed over uh, command to, uh, to General Kiani there on the right. Uh, and Musharraf is saluting his, uh, his troops as they, as they walk away. Uh, it, was a, it was an emotional moment uh, for him. Um, I mean, uh, obviously he realized, uh, in, in addition to uh, ending a long, uh, a long and uh, however way you look at it, for Musharraf, a very successful military career, um, uh, it was tough for him, and of course he knew that he was uh, he was giving up the power, um, his ultimate power, um, and now he's in trouble uh, because he doesn't have the army. Um, uh, Kiani um, Kiani has played this very smart. Um, he's uh, he's he's kept a, a certain amount of neutrality in this particular crisis, um, and. Uh, and Musharraf uh, may get hung out to dry, uh, and it may happen sooner than some think. When the Supreme Court justice um, was fired in March, um, the, the lawyers community, the, the, the black coats, um, rose up and continue to, um, to lead the charge on the restoration of the ju judiciary. Um, some judges have been restored. Uh, the, the, the holdout, of course, is um, uh, they have not restored uh, Iftikhar Chaudhry to, to his position as a Supreme Court justice. Um, that's a complicated uh, situation. Um, if he was to come back into power um, as the Supreme Court justice, he would most uh, probably rule against um, um, Musharraf's uh, re-election uh, this last year, uh, which by most accounts was uh, unconstitutional. Um, 
Uh, of course, the Ch con Pakistani constitution has has, uh, has proven very flexible over the last uh, couple of years. Musharraf has, has had it uh, changed a number of times, um, and and it, it's amazing, you know, in Pakistani. Uh, Political circles, the the devotion, the incredible devotion, which is given to the minutia of uh, of um, of the pretense that everything that they're doing is actually legally justified. Um, it's it's phenomenal the links that they, that will be, that, a, that the government will go to to change certain aspects of the constitution or the law to make the ju the their actions um, justified. Um, part of the uh, Part of the, the the laws that were changed during the uh, state of the emergency, which happened late late in the year, um, some of those laws that were changed, the laws were changed so that they could not, after the emergency was over and, and after a new government came into power, it would be illegal for any new government to to um, to charge uh, uh, Musharraf or any anyone in that party for actions that were uh, taken during the emergency. Uh, they go to great lengths to to um, to justify their actions. The, the lawyers' community has been very very um, adamant on the restoration of uh, of Chaudhry, and um, and uh, there is some uh, uh, reticence uh, on the part of, uh, of of the leader of the PPP now, um, Benazir's widow, um, because uh, one of the um, one of the benefits that he got um, from the um, from Musharraf and, uh, was a deal um, uh, absolving him from um, corruption charges. Yeah, and historically, the courts in Pakistan have always supported the military and, have in fact, given legal cover to coups. Yes. Why do you think that changed last year? Why did how did this movement come about? Well, uh, they had a they had a chief justice. Um, um, you know, the chief justice justices in uh, in, in in this system um, come from seniority, and he was the senior most judge, and uh, and um, and he went his own way. Um, it was it's very very rare in Pakistan for that to happen, and. Um, and he was about to make a, a judgment, um, as most of you may know, on whether um, on whether uh, Musharraf's candidacy was constitutional or not, and uh, and uh, Musharraf was going to take no chances on that and removed him. Um, Pakistani, uh, he never expected the, the 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 Pakistani people to to be so insulted by that move uh, to remove it. People are very resilient in Pakistan. They 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 can tolerate a lot, um, but for them to to watch the, the chief justice of another branch of government uh, be removed um, for for the, under the flimsy ac accusations, uh, the ac the, the, he was accused of of um, of letting his son use a government vehicle. Um, you know, in a country like Pakistan, that's the least uh, you could ever be accused of. Uh, um, <laughs> incredible, <laughs> and and other and other very flimsy charges uh, under for which he was removed. Everybody knew that he was removed uh, because uh, because he was going to make uh, a judgment one way or another on Musharraf's uh, legitimacy as president. And so uh, Musharraf was going to take no chances, and he, and he really didn't expect um, that that people would be so incensed by it, and that the whatever popularity he had um, would just vanish because of that act. I should, I should describe this photo. This man is a. This man is a, is, dry, is riding his bike around town. His son was one of the so-called disappeared. Um, hundreds of hundreds of people have uh, have disappeared over the last um, um, seven eight years. Um, um, the accusations are that they were taken by the intelligence services um, um, because of whatever act, anti-government activities. Um, you talk to people involved in this, um, even human rights people. They'll admit that some of the people who were disappeared. Um, Many of them were innocent of uh, innocent of anything. Uh, others, uh, others were uh, hardcore uh, Islamic militants, and even others of the disappear, d disappeared were actually um, most likely um, working um, for the in Pakistani intelligence services and were um, were killed or captured in India. And um, and of course that's something that the uh, the government would never uh, would never admit uh, admit to. So they're disappeared. Um, they're considered disappeared. Families don't know where they went. Um, uh, some of these some of these people have been released. Um, others have not. This is a, one of the protesters approaching a, a line of, of Pakistani uh, paramilitary troops during one of the protests. They came to they came to call him President Busharraf. Uh, go Busharraf, go uh, was the chant. And this is one of the many. Um, Lawyers' protests um, that were held. This was held outside of uh, near the house of uh, the sacked Supreme Court judge. 
During the state of emergency, um, protests, of course, were banned. Uh, this is a, a supporter of Benazir Bhutto. Um, there in the streets, uh, um, protesters came out and were qu very quickly rounded up and sometimes, uh, as you can see, handled very roughly. Um, these policemen took a special, uh, special joy in, um, in, s in smacking folks around with their uh, batons, their lattes. There wasn't a lot of live fire. Um, it was mostly just physical beatings. This picture in Lahore, um, as many of you know, P uh, former Prime Minister Bhutto was a house arrested twice, um, and the second time when it was in uh, Lahore, when she was about to lead a so-called Long March uh, protest to Islamabad. This woman was a human rights activist who was who was thrown into the into the paddy wagon there, along with many others. And on October 18th um, is when she returned from eight years in exile. Uh, there was a huge amount of t anticipation. This picture was taken, I think, the day before. And this is, as you can see, only three people on the scooter, which is two, two less than normal in Karachi. <laughs> A supporter um, of, of Ms. But Mrs. Bhutto the night before her arrival, the late afternoon, I guess. And this is kind of how the float looked. You don't really get a sense of the huge crowds uh, in this particular image, but it's close enough to where you can see where she was standing. Um, Christina, I don't see you in this one, but you were you up I'm there at the there time? Somewhere. I was on it the whole thing. Yeah. You're on there the on whole the time. Left-hand side somewhere. They had set up a number of buses for the media um, ahead uh, ahead of the uh, of this vehicle. Um, it was it was mayhem to work in this crowd. I can tell you. Um, you <laughs> You were you were lucky to be uh, up on top. Uh, uh, many of the women working in this crowd were very uh, seriously groped um, during this uh, during this venture. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I escaped that personally. <laughs> um, Benazir, she you know uh, she would she you can't even see it behind her about a meter is a green sort of glass bulletproof thing uh, that she that was up there um, it, it was designed this thing was designed to save her life but she wanted to get up and she wanted to be close to her people um, whatever you think whatever you think about Benazir's past and her politics one thing's for sure um, Benazir Bhutto was a very very courageous woman and uh, and she was not she was not afraid or she didn't show it she didn't show it publicly and uh, and she uh, you know up until the the second she died she was uh, extremely courageous this uh, of course later on is when the blast happened I photographed until sunset um, and um, and then left. Uh, one of my colleagues took over for the evening part. I'd I'd been out since 6 a.m. to get a position at the airport. Of course, she didn't show up until mid late afternoon. Um, uh, and we'd been standing out in the sun all day. So I, I was out. I'd photographed him without trying to trying to file at a, a local hotel, and uh, a colleague was there. Um, ultimately, um, ultimately, none of us from, from Getty were close to the blast when it happened. Hours later, um, uh, Lev Deris uh, from AP here in the uh, here amongst us here was 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 close enough to be injured. Um, and, and Christina, uh, you miraculous, miraculously escaped uh, injury as well. But uh, uh, the blast, ultimate, ultimately the blast was, the blasts, especially one of them was massive. Uh, many of the people you see in the white, um, these security fellas, um, down towards the lower left of this frame were all, were all killed. <clears throat> Noir Sharif, um, his return was uh, was uh, equal, equally triumphant. Uh, uh, in his case, in Lahore, which is his uh, his stronghold, um, he came back. It was a very different type of uh, 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 reception. Um, uh, Benazir Bhutto, they, the PPP, her party had brought in people from all around the country um, and on buses, uh, huge numbers. Um, Nawaz's uh, fans were mostly local um, local supporters in, 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 in Lahore because pretty much everyone there, there adores him. And, uh, and it, w it went all night long uh, just like this. It was quite a, quite a raucous uh, um, event. They got together um, for one meeting. Um, not long before she was killed, um, to try and come together and um, and forge forge some alliance against uh, uh, against Musharraf. Um, as you can see, um, Nawaz Sharif is not looking uh, very happy at the time. He uh, he had just that day um, been um, disqualified from running uh, running for office by uh, by the electoral commission, um, uh, and so he had to come. And the, the, his meeting with with. Uh, 
with Benazir Bhutto had already been scheduled, so he had to show up at her house, um, having totally been disqualified. So he 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 had to arrive in a power in a position of extreme weakness, which he 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 doesn't like, and uh, and so they met and uh, came up with some agreements and had a press conference. This image was taken. Um, Near um, in, in the family mausoleum after she was killed, um, uh, the uh, the funeral itself um, was held during that the day before. I I, went, I flew down in a charter plane uh, with some other journalists from Islamabad and uh, and uh, missed the actual funeral. But there was lots of lots of action going on there for several days. These are uh, these are rose petals covering her coffin. And let's look here now at um, a series of pictures from from December 27th of last year. The campaign rally in Rawalpindi, uh, which you all know is just next to Islamabad, um, had been scheduled um, for, for much before. When she had been put under house arrest in, um, in Islamabad, um, she had planned on taking out this massive rally in Rawalpindi. And Musharraf uh, and his government said that it was far too dangerous, we can't allow you to do it. Um, they had intel that there were suicide bombers that were out to, to get her, and, uh, and of course, um, they didn't let her go out, um, and so when this, when the rally finally happened, when the the, the the state of emergency was finally lifted, it lasted all of November, I think, five weeks, five or six weeks. Um, she took out a, a. First of all, she went into the NWFP, the North Northwest Frontier Province, and did some very small campaign events um, in sort of backyards. Um, I didn't. I didn't go to those. They were very small events uh, and very. Um, very um, impromptu, uh, last minute, um, so that the, so that the, they could defeat any sort of security threat. This one in Rawalpindi was announced a full week ahead of time. Uh, everyone knew where it was going to be, um, and, uh, and the ones who who set out to kill her had plenty of time to to do their planning. And uh, this is her up on stage, um, just just before sunset, uh, glancing over at me, and uh, the other photojournalists there um, there on the, up on the stage. And this is how it looked from behind her. Um, at, the, at this particular moment, um, uh, she was talking about, about the need to defeat terrorism um, in Pakistan. And I know that's what she was saying, not, not because I speak Urdu, but because, um, because that particular, this particular moment was filmed, was video uh, 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 filmed by a, uh, the PTI, um, uh, the, the National Television um, Network, um, had a cameraman down there, and, and this particular clip, this very moment, was showed over, was shown over and over on Pakistani uh, television. And so uh, I had taken a chair and put it, stood up behind her. Of course, very um, uh, obvious to the crowd. Uh, and so I was up there taking these pictures when, um, when that particular clip of video was shot. So when, when, when Pakistanis, uh, because Getty Images doesn't have any, we don't have any clients in Pakistan. No, none of the newspapers uh, get our service uh, there. Um, Many of my Pakistani friends had not seen the photographs that I took, but they knew I was there because of <laughs> because they'd seen me on TV over and over again, and they hadn't seen me at the blast site because, um, in fact, when the bomb went off, there was no um, there was no cameraman there, <clears throat> some mobile phones, but not real camera work. It was an adoring crowd, I say, between five and eight thousand. Um, it's hard to say, really. Um, they, these these folks uh, were up front, um, part of the women's wing of the P, uh, of the PPP. The event finished, and I left quickly. Um, as you can see, um, I'll go back here. Uh, as you can see from this image, um, it's a, it, it sort of see it's a closed park, Lialkot Bog. Um, and there were, certain, there were very few entry points and exit points. There was one right on the left. And um, as soon as she was done, I made a hasty retreat uh, to get out um, because uh, I knew that most of this crowd was going to have to pass through that very small opening. So I got out ahead of the crowd. I'd been there all day. I was tired. Um, I wanted to get back and follow my pictures and be done. And, and as I left the event, um, I was walking down the street towards my car, and I took a glance over my one last look over my shoulder, and there she came. There, this is what I saw: her coming out from behind the stage uh, onto the street. This is uh, the street that runs uh, next to the park, and she she was um, standing and waving out uh, 
the uh, escape hatch or sunroof or whatever you want to call it of her armored vehicle, very exposed. Uh, uh, I couldn't believe it then. I still can't now. She she was uh, she was uh, whatever you want to call it. She was uh, very courageous. Uh, uh, was she was she foolish? Uh, perhaps um, with her security. Um, but one thing for sure is that she was uh, she was courageous and 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 she wanted to get close to her people. And uh, the, as you can see, you can't really see how dark it is there because of the exposure, but uh, it was getting very dark. Uh, uh, the crowd was pushing, jostling, shoving around. I am about, I guess, about three meters in front of her vehicle with a wide lens. I'm getting pushed around, and uh, you know, later on, um, I saw. I think it was. Channel 4 ITN, they got hold of a cell, uh, mobile phone video um, shot from a vehicle that was following her. Um, and you could see, not right here, but a, about 10 seconds later, later how the, um, the gunman and the bomber, the assassin, comes from the right-hand side of the frame and works his way through the crowd and gets very close to her before firing shots. I moved about 20 meters ahead of the vehicle. The, the, her car surged forward just a bit. Um, and I, and I moved ahead, I moved out of the way, and I got in front of the vehicle, and I turned around, and as I looked back at uh, Mrs. Buto, I heard three shots go off, um, and she fell down through the, um, to the escape hatch of her armored vehicle. And as she, as she was falling down through the hatch, um, I was raising my camera, and um, I pressed down on the shutter um, release, uh, to get a picture, of really, of the shooting, um, and as, as I took the first, this was the first frame here, and it was the uh, the gunman setting off his charge, um, and it, it's hard to see, but the the fellow sort of in the checkered uh, shirt on the left, just above him, um, that that orange place there is actually her vehicle. That's her vehicle on uh, on the sort of the left hand side of the frame. And right in the center of the frame, where you see the brightest spot, is the actual suicide bomber himself, right next to the car. Um, he was po shooting from point blank range, and then and then blew himself up right there. And this uh, this frame uh, this frame was taken right at the instant of the, f the first instant. And and as a, a, these digital cameras uh, these days shoot very quick um, on the motor drive, and this was um, a couple, if not the next, uh, one of the couple frames later, they shoot up to, you know, um, between five and ten frames a second. So this is still the blast itself, because uh, nothing caught fire. Um, no vehicles burned. It was a blast. And this, uh, so the blast is still, is, is sort of withering away here. And you can see the hottest point there in the middle is the suicide bomber himself. And right to the left of him is the vehicle. Something's flying through the air right there. I think it's probably part of his body. There was a lot of debris in the air. These people, these people right in front of me um, uh, were, uh, I believe, uninjured. Um, they, pushed, uh, they pushed me back. I got swept up in the crowd and uh, was pushed back away from the scene um, as, this, as the blast happened. Were you not thrown back by the force? Of the no, blast? actually, the concussion didn't actually throw me around at all. It was uh, I was I was so, somewhat deafened uh, for a couple hours, um, which made it even more eerie afterwards because it was it was at first it was very silent uh, at least for me, and uh, and um, and it, no, I, I was not injured. Um, I was very lucky. The, the, the size of this bomb, um, luckily for me and for the people in this frame here, um, was much, much smaller than the one um, in, in Karachi. And, uh, and it's, it's, these are the parts of the suicide bomber. The stuff in the air, um, it could have been part of the um, ham, it could have been part of the vehicle. It, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what those uh, things flying through the air is. The, the thing right in the center of the, uh, of, the, of the frame, right above the white vehicle, I suspect that's part of him, although I'm not sure. It's hard to say. This was taken right afterwards. Um, the people in front of me in that previous frame had fled behind me. These people were still in front. This is a, a, a campaign poster falling down in front of me. Uh, you can see it with its, um, its sort of the stick uh, taped to it um, to be held aloft. Uh, it was falling down in front of my lens. These two fellows were struggling to get out of the way. You could hear the, her vehicle uh, revving its engines in the background. You, the, the car next to her had driven up against the median there. You see it on the left, uh, her white vehicle there. Of course, she was lying inside dying at the moment. Um, and you can still see the smoke from the blast. As you, as you can see, there's no fire. Um, it was just a, a big bomb. And her vehicles quickly drove off. I, I moved, I moved to the right very quickly to get out of the way. 
But the vehicles, the vehicles were relatively undamaged. The blast was not huge. And in fact, no one in, the, in, the, in her vehicle was injured, except... The debris ex still in the air. The, the, the debris was still in the air. It, would, it flew very, up, uh, very high in the air, and some of it was coming down. N none of this is dust inside my camera. Anything you see there is actually uh, is debris. This man in the, this brown jacket uh, appeared on the scene very quickly. Uh, he was photographed uh, um, by other photojournalists as well, because uh, he stayed around for a long time. He appeared about a minute after the blast. Um, and I came, I came back, I got pushed back from the scene and, and came back, and he was very, very emotional. Um, this picture was actually taken before the last one. This is the, one of the first frames I took when I, when I came back uh, closer to the scene. Um, these people in the background, most of them are dead. Um, this fellow, his, uh, you can see his, uh, on the right side, his left pant leg was blown off, it was actually blown off his leg. Uh, he walked away from this uh, with the aid of, of several people who came up. People appeared immediately. Uh, as I was shooting this, people were running up from behind me uh, to, to, to help him away. Did they help walk him? He actually was able to walk, uh, walked away from it. He's touching the back of his head to see if he's, he's injured. As the ambulance arrives, uh, ambulances arrived, uh, people, the wounded were carried uh, to them even before the stretchers could come out. There were, there were many wound, wounded people there, many of them desperately so. These people had uh, succumbed to their injuries. Um, there was a poster of her there, and this is right there at the scene of the blast. And of course, they're covered with, uh, with the banners, the flags of the Pakistan People's Party. These, these um, survivors here were, um, as you can see, the crowd is fleeing. Um, these pictures uh, that I'm showing you are not uh, specifically in chronological order. Um, uh, this was, as I was getting s pushed back by the crowd, um, uh, these, these, folk, these two folks uh, turned around to look at the site. Uh, you know, the, it was a desperate scene, horrifying for everyone, but everyone there. How do you keep photographing in a situation like that? Don't you want to just get away? Well, I have to say, the, the, the idea of a, sec a secondary blast did, did cross my mind. Um, but um, in this particular case, I, I try to follow my instincts as best I can. And uh, we all do as journalists. Um, and, and often when we don't, uh, we do so at our peril. Um, and my instinct, and it happened to be right in this occasion was to stay, that, that, that somehow whatever was going to happen had happened. Um, uh, the horror of it uh, was, you know, was terrible. But the, the, the danger aspect, for some reason, I, even though there had been two blasts in the previous uh, attack, I just, something told me that the, 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 the violence, the, the, the violence of the moment was over. And, uh, and, um, and so I stayed. And, uh, and continued uh, continued working, and uh, this was right. This was probably maybe a, on, I looked at the digital time codes on the on these pictures because the digital f cameras you can look at exactly what time the pictures were taken, and then I think this was about a minute, minute five seconds after after the blast. Um, from the time um, from the time that you see the, the picture of the of her waving from the car. Um, until the photograph, the first photograph of the of the blast itself, um, I think uh, 12 seconds had passed, and so uh, and so that was uh, that was 12 seconds. Uh, me to move forward, uh, and then between that picture uh, and this picture, or, or the the final ones that I took, uh, I think 10 minutes had passed, and then it was dark. Uh, it got very dark, and they'd carried away most people, and so I and I left. I I, I walked back to my. Uh, I found my taxi driver who, uh, who had been very close. I did not know it, but he had been very close uh, as well and, and had luckily uh, survived uh, unscathed. Um, and, um, and he and I uh, embraced and then walked, uh, walked, to, walked to the car and then um, waded into traffic um, and uh, a rush hour in Raul Pindi. And, uh, and as, as police vehicles moved, were continuing to come to the scene, we were moving another way. The, the traffic was very heavy and I had 
um, a long, uh, long drive back to the house to to uh, think about what I had seen and uh, and um, and look at the uh, look at the pictures on the camera and uh, you know many of the photographs were uh, were unusable for various reasons because of gore or because um, because they simply weren't sharp. I, I everything many of the photographers there were using most were using flash because it was quite dark and, uh, and it doesn't look that dark here but it was and um, and so there were a lot of pictures that were just unusable for many different reasons. Um, this uh, this particular set survived, and so. Uh, at this point, had it already been announced that she's she's died? No, in fact, not at all. Uh, if we want to uh, br bring up the lights, this is the, the last image, so we can we can just talk a little bit about uh, about this and that. Uh, they had not um, they had not announced her death until later. Um, she was. She was certainly gone by then. Um, uh, I didn't know she was. I didn't know she was dead. Um, none of us at the scene. I s strongly suspected that she was, because um, because I had seen. I didn't see the gunman, um, because the crowd was in my way. But I saw her and I saw her go down. And I heard the shots. Um, there was some speculation immediately thereafter that uh, that it had been a sniper. Um, as far as I was concerned, the three cracks that I heard came right from that vehicle. It, they didn't. They weren't these uh, echoing shots in the distance. They were three cracks that came from. Um, at least that's what I counted. Three three shots uh, right from right from there. And so I I strongly suspected that she had been shot. And at that range, I. I, I, I thought that she was probably killed, but, uh, but none of it was official. Um, I didn't go to the hospital. Uh, a, a colleague, uh, Warwick Page, uh, who was uh, who's freelance but was working with Getty through all this time, um, um, he, went, uh, he went and uh, to the hospital and photographed when they brought the coffin out and uh, the grief there. Um, I, and I, I was busy filing photo, photos uh, well into the evening. And, um, as it turned out, there were there weren't any television cameras there, um, and in fact, there was only one other photographer uh, near me um, when the blast happened. Most of the journalists were caught inside when the when the crowd uh, when the crowd left um, the event. Um, they poured through that narrow opening. Most of the journalists were caught behind them, um, so most folks covering that event. In addition, a lot of uh, foreign journalists who would have been there uh, weeks before had gone uh, had gone. If they didn't live in Pakistan, they'd gone home for the holidays. Uh, this is the 27th of December. It was just two days after Christmas, and so a, lo a lot of people who had been covering that story heavy since her return um, had left, and and they planned on coming back. Uh, uh, um, uh, Christina, perhaps you would plan on coming back for the election. Yeah. Uh, every, many journalists, uh, international journalists, uh, had a Pakistani visa there in their passport because uh, uh, they were ready to come back on, uh, on January 8th, uh, less than two weeks away, uh, for, the, uh, for the election. And so um, after, the, after the event, uh, the assassination took place, everyone got on the first plane they could and came in. Um, as many of you know, the, there were several days of riots. Uh, um, I didn't cover the rioting. I was trying to get down for the funeral and uh, spend a lot of time in airports and then trying to uh, uh, negotiate, uh, you know, working there in the, at the shrine. Um, the, the, the rioting itself, I didn't, I, I didn't cover, but it happened for a couple days. But uh, while, by the time a lot of folks came back and got in, um, it had, the situation had calmed down. Uh, Pakistan runs hot and cold uh, and very quickly. And, uh, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, and I'll open it up to the floor. I don't want to sure. monopolize you, because I'm sure people would love to ask you things. What did you think of the government's account that she had hit her head on the sunroof? Well, because there was never a proper autopsy done, um, we're never going to really know. Um, I suspect uh, clearly um, it was in the government's um, interest to show that, um, um, you know, that she had been um, 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 irresponsible in standing up out through her car and she was killed by the blast because she was up there and she'd hit her head. Um, whereas the, uh, the Pakistan People's Party was there in their interest to show that, uh, that she had been assassinated by a gunman. And uh, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, that fellow killed her. To me, it wasn't as relevant um, um, as it was to a lot of other people. I, I was sure that that fellow is the one. I was fairly sure that the guy who who, who pulled the trigger was also the the, the suicide bomber. Um, ultimately, um, ultimately, we'll, we'll never know. Scot Scotland Yard um, concluded, I think, that um, that it was the blast, but the the. The, the proper <coughs> autopsy was never done, and uh, the damage—the damage that would have been done um, 
to her head, uh, if she had hit the side of, uh, of that escape hatch, would have been massive because the force of the blast would have thrown her uh, several hundred kilometers an hour into the side of, uh, of reinforced steel. Um, uh, equally a gunshot at that range uh, would have killed her as well. And it, would, it would be hard to imagine that he would miss uh, shooting three times uh, from a meter or two away. Uh, so um, I don't, I'll, we'll never know. But um, either way, I, I suspect it was that fellow. Government minister in, in this country who was involved in the deal between her and Musharraf said to me that we might as well have painted a bullshot target, a bullseye target on her forehead. You followed her around in the run-up to this. Right. Do you think that she knew that she was going to be killed? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, I can, I can, as far as security goes, I can say this: the, the security for the event. I don't know what she. I can't pretend to know what she was thinking. But the security for the event. Um, was not bad. They body searched, as far as I could tell, most folks that most people that went in for the uh, campaign event were, were searched. Um, I tried to stay away from the entry points as much as possible. I took a few pictures and, and then moved away because I, I suspected um, that there might be some um, foul play during that day um, and that if a bomber uh, came in, he would probably get caught there at one of the entry points and he would set off his charge, uh, which would kill a number of policemen and supporters and cancel the event. And, and then they would get what, get what they wanted, a cancellation of spoiling the event. Um, they were. Um, they were a lot more specific in what they wanted. They just didn't want to spoil the event. They wanted it dead. And so they, they were very patient and waited. And probably knowing, well, when she came to the event, she was also standing up through that roof. <clears throat> and so they probably had a pretty good guess that she might do that on the way out. And so they waited uh, very patiently. And, uh, and as you can see in that, uh, in that um, mobile phone video, <clears throat> she, uh, the gunman moves through the crowd very deliberately, uh, gets close, and takes his shots. Um, and, um, it was very bizarre for me to watch this video as well because then the explosion happens and the mobile phone drops to the ground and it's there for maybe 20 seconds just on the ground and then it gets picked up again and starts, starts filming again. And you can see the fellow in the brown jacket arriving to the scene and raising his arms and screaming. And then uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the far background you see a silhouette of uh, one person uh, with a camera bag uh, <laughs> hanging from his shoulder uh, moving towards the scene and that was me. And, uh, and then it cuts, um, which is very strange uh, for me to watch. Um, I don't know if she thought she was going to be killed. I, I, just, I don't think she thought she was going to be killed, but she, she had to have known the danger. As you said, it's very difficult to understand why she popped up through that sunroof. She felt, you know, she, all I can imagine, imagine is that she, that she felt she really had to get close. Uh, that was the way she was going to win this election, is to show that she was not afraid and that she would get close uh, to her people and she was not going to be threatened. Uh, she was not going to be scared. Um, that's what I imagine. Can I invite questions? Can you, this gentleman here? There's a microphone, Thank actually. Um, we'll have a microphone brought over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just a bit surprised that um, you haven't mentioned anything about um, your brethren, journalists, and the media, which was under attack. Um, you haven't done, mentioned anything. You are not probably going to do. But no. I expect you to be very vocal about it. Now, um, that's by the way. Um, what do you think of? Um, First, the authorities saying she hit the head, her head on the, on the side of the vehicle. Right. And, and then doing a clean-up job very, very quickly. Uh, why the West hasn't um, really come down upon the authorities? what they did and why did they do it? Well, certainly, you know, certainly cleaning up the, the scene of this crime was, uh, <laughs> was uh, outrageous. Um, I, I wasn't there at the, when that happened. There were some photographers there that photographed uh, that particular event. Uh, it was uh, outrageous that they, 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 they cleaned the crime scene so quickly. Uh, and it was outrageous, um, frankly, that, uh, that a better job wasn't do done at the hospital uh, at, at, documenting, uh, at documenting what happened to her. Um, as far as as far as uh, as far as the um, the uh, silencing of 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 local television, um, geo, uh, everyone basically that was uh, that that was that was outrageous. Um, um, Musharraf is, himself had liberalized um, um, 
for the media in Pakistan, um, and you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And uh, and people had come come to really um, uh, uh, appreciate um, the uh, the the free press coverage that was available in Pakistan, uh, and it was uh, and and still you know up until uh, up until this election. Um, the, uh, the the government was muffling um, uh, criticism. That said, um, strangely, they 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 were much uh, more hands off with the print media. I guess one of the reasons why I haven't brought it up so much is because I'm print media, and they um, and they they. They didn't um, mess with us as much as they uh, did with uh, television. Um, the Pakistani television was uh, was highly censored, taken off the air. Um, but uh, but newspapers were still publishing critical accounts um, in uh, uh, in Pakistan, um, more so in the English language. In newspapers, um, I think the, um, the some of the Urdu uh, uh, publications had uh, more uh, censorship uh, brought to bear, uh, pressure put on them. Um, but the the um, the print media we got off a lot easier than the um, than the um, the broadcast media, and that's I guess that's why I haven't brought it up. Not because I didn't think it's important, uh, but rather because it affected me a little bit less. I'm talking more about my personal experiences. So, um, uh, but but no, it was a, it was an affront uh, to journalism, um, uh, certainly in Pakistan. Over there, yeah. Oh, sorry, you've got the microphone. You want me to go ahead? Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Um, I'm a doctor. I'm sorry, boasting about my profession, but anyway, mm -hmm. that's what the question is about. <laughs> but before I ask you the question, I was given to understand that there are only either one or two gates at that Liaquat Bagh where she was making that speech that day before being killed or assassinated, whichever word you want. So that the plotters or people who organized this assassination, they knew that this is the exit gate and they had planted these people there. So it was all, looks like, it was a plan, no doubt about it. But, or was it, is there one gate in and one out or only one gate for in and out or what? I mean, you were there, so... Well, for her vehicle yes. uh, to leave, there was one gate. Exactly. There was and one the gate. other thing was that whenever there is a violent death, for whatever reason, suicide or assassination, even if there is no post-mortem, x-rays are taken of the whole body as such, right from your skull to the tip of your toe, big toe. And there was some um, thing floating about on the internet in which they did sort of show that, you know, the, the skull and the holes in the skull, which were clearly a bullet skull. So this uh, theory that with the blast, it was a counter, you know, uh, coup on the other side of the head. Right. The went and the blood collected and she died. I don't know. Have you got any? Did, have you seen that thing on the uh, there is internet? An you have seen it. I, there is an x-ray. I, I have not seen the x-ray uh, my, myself. No, you uh, haven't seen it, but on the internet itself. Well, have you heard about it? Have you, have you come across it? I know that the uh, X-ray exists, but the uh, a, a proper autopsy wasn't done. Uh, but the, there, there exists an, an X-ray where there was a lot of damage. Um, but I, that would show the bullet wound, wouldn't it? Well, I, I wish I could talk, speak to that, but I. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what killed her. Um, I, I, I watched it. Some people she was it. shot here in mm. the neck, so it w wouldn't have Just shown. Just behind the ear, left ear. Yeah. We have the next question. John, I just wanted to ask a question about the army personnel in the north er northern areas. Um, did you ever get a feel for the psyche of those soldiers because they're working? in their own territory, they're fighting as Muslims versus Muslims fighting each other. And, right. Uh, did you feel like there was any conflict in their internal Psyche. Well, with the um, with the paramilitary troops, they were from the Frontier Corps, and the Frontier Corps are, are almost, as far as I know, all Pashtuns. Um, they uh, they come from the tribal areas. They come from a northwest frontier province, uh, and so for them, uh, I think there is a there a fair amount of uh, 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 difficulty. Um, in fact, when when the government decided to crack down on the um, on the militants in the Swat Valley, at first they used the paramilitary forces, which were all these um, Frontier Corps uh, troops, and um, and frankly, it wasn't the their their offensive wasn't going very well. Um, was it because these fellows had a hard time uh, killing um, uh, their brethren? Um, I can't answer that. But when they brought in the army, which are which are as many of you know mostly Punjabis. Um, 
they made a lot more progress uh, a lot a lot quicker because perhaps uh, they were more willing to uh, to shoot these fellas. Uh, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, they, we weren't given much access. You know, I I, I, I photograph a lot of militaries uh, in that part of the world. Uh, the Pakistani military brings us along occasionally, but under very um, very supervised and, and sometimes uh, staged managed uh, uh, situations. Uh, we we don't get a whole lot of. Uh, you can't embed. I can't embed with the Pakistani military and go with them for a f couple weeks on an operation. There's not that level of trust at all. In fact, there's a lot of distrust. And so um, and so for me to get inside and be able to see exactly what was happening uh, was uh, uh, very dis discouraged uh, from doing that by the government and certainly not invited. So I, I, my hunch is that uh, it was harder for some than others, but I wasn't actually there. <laughs> my name is Mimi Hans. I am a first year at the London School of Economics. And um, I was just curious about the penetration of foreign militants in the area. You mentioned um, the Uzbek um, Taliban, who seemed to be pretty strong. Mm. How far would you say uh, foreign elements have a hold there? Um, you know, the government is very, um, they talk about the foreign hand, um, the foreign hand can mean various things, of course, the foreign hand uh, is often a, a, is used to d talk about the Indians, um, but uh, they, they, they don't like to go into specifics about who's doing what. They, they have talked about the Uzbeks uh, quite a bit. Um, I, would, I would say the majority um, of, the, of the fighters there, probably 98% are local. It's a, um, a lot, most, most, maybe not 98%, maybe 90%. Most of them are local. And the Uzbeks who are there are not people who are coming in uh, two weeks ago from Uzbekistan. They're, they, are, they are fellows who came in, um, some of them for the, the jihad against the Soviets uh, um, years before, and they settled um, in those tribal areas um, and, and continue to live there. They speak, they speak the local language, uh, they, they know the local customs, um, and many of, them, um, many of the groups are considered very hardcore and, uh, and um, even much more uh, radical, much more radical than the local people than the Waziris. Um, they are foreign elements, but they've been there. Many of them have been there for a while. Um, as far as um, as far as foreign fighters, as in um, um, Palestinians or Sudani uh, people from Sudan, uh, people people from Iraq, uh, uh, there's not considered to be that many. Um, although a lot of a lot of experts will tell you that uh, the the suicide bomb making technology, which uh, you see uh, using to such great effect in Afghanistan and now in Pakistan as well, um, has been imported um, uh, from. Iraq, um, where they've uh, where they spent some time perfecting their techniques and uh, and bringing those techniques over um, and uh, and sharing them with the militants because uh, um, in society uh, suicide bombing doesn't many will tell you does not come natural to um, to that culture in Western Pakistan and um, uh, in Afghanistan it's not something that's been uh, used through the years uh, whereas uh, where it's been uh, Palestinians have been doing it for a while. Um, it's new to the folks there, and it was imported. There's a question over here. John, do you know where Rahman Malik was on the 27th of December? And Christina, are you... you, are you my name is Kavi, and, and Christina, you were uh, with Rahman Malik in Karsas in October at the time of the first attempt. And so would you mind giving us uh, an assessment of how you found him? What, what, what is your impression of his personality, of his integrity? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, um, I don't know where he was. That that on, on December twenty seventh, uh, I I I was not. Um, <laughs> I barely knew where I was. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps people need to remind it that he was the security chief. He was at home. <laughs> he, he was. Uh, there was a lot of criticism about that. Um, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm honestly not trying to dodge the question. Um, I, I don't. I don't want to talk about things that I that I that I'm, I'm not as well versed in as I might. I mean, maybe you know more about this. Uh, yeah, Christina. I mean, I can't answer much about that day. I know he was on the bus. I wasn't actually 
although he has given interviews, I know, saying that he was talking to me at the time of the blast. Um, I was talking to Etazaz Asen at the time of the, the blast. So I personally told him, in fact, he gave one of the interviews sitting in a car with me afterwards, and I said, that's not true, I was not speaking to you. But I mean, it didn't really seem to matter very much in the greater scheme of things who, and there was a lot of confusion, so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of controversy about Rehman Malik because people feel he should have been with Benazir that day, that it was suspicious that he left, that he also gave an interview saying that she was fine after the, the blast, and when in fact she was, as we know, not. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it, it's speculation is very difficult to know. He, he should. He, uh, obviously, he should have been there. I mean, it was. Uh, yeah, he the, the, have been the, there. It was a very. Um, anyone who. Um, anyone should have known that was a very dangerous place uh, for her to be because, uh, um, you know, there have been many attacks in Rawalpindi. It's a uh, garrison town which uh, which uh, is very has been very hard for the army to control. Um, and the, the um, intelligence services, uh, they've done a very poor job at securing even their own people from attacks. And so, uh, and so uh, I, clearly he should have been there. But, but as far as the, the why, um, I, I, I can't say. We've got time, I think, just for two more questions. So uh, it's one right at the back there, and then this gentleman here. Um, my name is Omer Sattar, and I'm a law student. Um, what do you think, when uh, they washed away the evidence over there, do you think that was just a mistake, that some careless mistake that some junior officials made, or, or was that um, with the authorization given from the highest of levels um, an intended attempt to wash away the evidence um, just to get rid of it? Well, certainly is, <laughs> at the very least, highly, highly suspicious. The, the, the problem is, um, with lots of things that happen um, in Pakistan, you some things are very clear, seem to be very, very clearly point to um, a cause and effect. This happened because of that. But when you try to put, when you try to gather the evidence, uh, you get very frustrated, um, especially when it's swept away so quickly. Um, it's very suspicious. I thought of all of us there were shocked. Um, that it happened. Um, I was, you know, I was not there at the time. I was busy transmitting my photographs. Um, in fact, uh, because of, you know, media organizations saw my pictures come out um, on our website and and go to a, all of our newspaper and magazine sub subscribers and um, and lined up very quickly. Um, to, to talk to me um, um, on air because uh, because uh, although certainly I wasn't the only uh, survivor of this event there were many there um, I was I was the only uh, I was the only American um, uh, journalist there um, and um, and at the blast itself others were inside um, and there was another photographer outside a British uh, photographer a younger photographer and um, um, and and so I, I was dealing with um, First, sending the pictures. Um, uh, you know, I my mother was actually visiting at the time. My both my mother and my mother-in-law. Um, we've got the only uh, my wife and I have the, have the only two grandchildren uh, in the in the in the family on both sides. And so uh, and so our mothers come out a couple times a year. Uh, they feel felt cheated that they haven't been able to see their their your young, young grandkids. And so they were out there um, visiting at the house when I came back. And I was you know I was not looking good when I came back in. Um, I wasn't injured, but I was. Uh, it was pretty messy, and uh, um, and so I was, you know, I w I wasn't paying all that close attention to what was happening happening at the scene, um, frankly, at the time. Just like you, um, I read accounts and, and and saw pictures later on, but I I wasn't there. This gentleman here. It's the microphone. Uh, my name is Samir Mahmood, and I'm a lawyer. Given the vacuum that has been created by her assassination, and also uh, given his outspoken stand against uh, Musharraf's successes, uh, do you think it's cause for re-evaluation re of uh, Imran Khan's uh, uh, prospects uh, for political leadership in the future? Well, in, in Imran Khan, um, 
he um, he took the high road uh, um, during much of this um, uh, during the emergency uh, during much of this last year. He scored a lot of points with uh, the Pakistani public um, uh, in general. Um, pro Imran's problem is that he doesn't have a a, a, a functioning political machine to the extent that the PPP and the uh, the Muslim League uh, do. I mean, he he he. You talk to most folks, and they say he he'd, he'd be a great leader, but uh, but he has not been able to put for uh, put forth the political machinery to translate translate that into uh, any sort of majority, or even or even any sort of proper proper uh, political party, really, because he, he I think he was the only one he was the only one from his party in office last time, um, which which is nothing. Um, sure, he was a he he had a very principled stand, but. Um, but he hasn't been able to translate that, that to power. Now, as far as Benazir is concerned, um, do I think she was the greatest hope? I don't know. Um, Benazir Bhutto had a, had a very checkered past, um, uh, and, and, uh, but at the same time, um, maybe this time was her chance to make it right. I, I can't say if that was the case or not. Um, what I'll say uh, once again is that she was, uh, uh, she was, uh, she was a very brave person. Um, whether uh, whether she would have become prime minister and become um, the woman, uh, the leader that uh, that uh, her father had been when he was in his prime, um, um, it's uh, it's only going to be speculation forever. Um, uh, but uh, but it horrified both people. I know many Pakistanis who really um, uh, really disliked her uh, as a as a politician. Thought she was the wrong way to go. All of them were horrified. I didn't. I never heard anyone who was even the most bitter opponent uh, take any joy in what happened that day. Um, uh, everyone was horrified and outraged. Uh, and you know, around the world, but in Pakistan, uh, it was uh, it was it was very hard to to discuss with folks at first. It was a, it was a very dark day. Thank you for a fascinating insight and for the incredibly powerful photographs, even kind of looking at them like <laughs> this. They were just really powerful. So thank you very much, John, for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.